Hi, thanks for watching another episode of My Wisconsin Backyard. I'm Brian Ewig. And I'm Tracy Newman. We begin season two with some new and exciting stories from around your community. Quite already. It's a sailplane, and in our next show, we'll take you soaring and tell you what it takes to fly one. Plus, we'll show you the traditional Hmong game of Tulu and introduce you to a 90-year-old ballroom dancer. All right, let's get right to the show. Brian, do you have that tape? Yeah, I got the tape. It's right over here. Tapes. Why does it always have to be tapes? Tape. Got it again. Gotta find it somewhere. Here is the tape. All right, Tracy, I got it. I got the tape. We can start the show now. Great. I was just looking for a dry place to set my phone. Huh. This is how ugly the stuff looks. But then they, they turn into something like that. This was a, a dairy barn in Cross Plains, Wisconsin. These are oak barn beams that are 150 years old, and it's gonna be a dining room table for a guy in Mugwanago. One night, just looking on the internet, I saw a picture of this American flag made out of barnwood, and I just, like, I just had to have it. And I thought, well, it can't be that hard to make. So I. I drove around the countryside looking for barns. I needed a gray barn and a white barn and a red barn, and I, f I found those three colors. I don't have any training. I didn't, I didn't have any schooling on any of this. I didn't have a mentor. My friend taught me how to weld for a few hours once. But after that, it's just like, making mistakes and yeah, I guess you learn faster from the mistakes. There's about a half a barn here. Usually a barn is, you know, 10, 20 tons worth of material. And it takes about 350 hours to take one down, starting with the shingles and then the roofing boards and then the siding and the framing and even the nails. I save all the nails and put on a trailer. I try to use every bit of it. The majority of what I do is barn wood. For one, it's, this is Wisconsin, it's what we have. Um, and the stories behind this material is, are, are run pretty deep. I've had people from like England and, and New Zealand call me and say, oh my gosh, that was, that was my great uncle so-and-so's barn, I, and I, I saw this on the internet. This is the original City of Madison flag. I think I'm sharing history. I, I think a lot of this material, well, I mean, it would just go in a landfill if I, if I wasn't using it. Then it's a no, whole other thing when you can save the stories as well. I picked up a bag of litter on a trip. So all the litter represents where the national parks are in the lower 48. If I can save more, then, then 
a few other people, then I can just like, it, it makes up for the people that, that maybe aren't recycling. And I feel like I can impact a little more than, than the average household. I don't know what it's like to, to live in some other states that aren't that cool, but our state's awesome and people, people love it. So it's cool that I'm kind of just showing people what we already have, redoing it a different way. This is a sport the Hmong people play back in Laos a long time ago. And then now we bring it to America. It's a new sport called Tulu. Back where we came from, our parents are, you know, like farmers. And we don't have time to gather together like this. So the only time we play this during New Year time. You harvest, and this is the only time that you have time to spend your time with your family, friends, and relatives. This is what gets them together. <laughs> you could do it every day after work. It become a habit for everybody. So this is a lot different from where we're coming from. And then you will play from eight level, from 10 feet to 70 feet. And all you do is just put the line like this. Some people, they make a nice thing loop like this, but for me, I just go crazy with it. And then when you throw, you just hold like this and just throw it at the same time and just follow through in the top of goal. <laughs> the game consists of stages. So the first stage, it, it consists of offense and defense. The defense are the one who spin and the, the offense is the one who hit. The offense try to spin as hard as they can, and the offense is the one who's trying to knock their top off. And if I'm the offense and mine doesn't spin as long as the defense, I, I don't get a point. In the second stage, it's not a defense offense. And in the third stage and fourth and fifth, all you do just, that's why we have this flat. We cap it like this. And the, the last one is the one that has the highest score. I basically grew up playing this game and um, I created great friendships. It's really like, once you get to know it, it's really fun and competitive. Like the younger Hmong people, there's other sports like uh, volleyball and soccer and uh, football. They all usually prefer that, but like, um, I just want like the new generation to like see how people used to play uh, with each other back in our country. It seems like the, the game is dying out. But what we're trying to uh, teach these kids and get them motivated is to, um, to make sure to keep the, the traditional alive. Whoa. It's on one now. Back home, it's like you, you hardly have a time to enjoy yourself with all the friends in the community. You have to have a habit, otherwise, um, you, you cannot just stay home after work because this country, not just us, but everybody got to have habit. You, you got you to gotta have something to do after work, go out there, have fun, enjoy yourself. Well, I married a dancer. She'd been dancing since the age of three. Gentlemen, we want to welcome you to the first day of competition. I had planned nothing for our 33rd wedding anniversary. And uh, so we went in for our first dance lesson on the 21st of December, uh, which was our 33rd anniversary. We stuck together for 63 years. She gave me five kids and uh, many, many dances. She loved it and 
She loved everybody in the studio, and they loved her. If uh, she were sitting this close to you, she'd, she'd pinch you. Always full of mischief. It's hard on all of us when, when mom passed, but uh, this gave him something to look forward to. I think it's probably the most important activity in his life right now. He is not just student, he is inspiration for everybody. Age, this is not a reason to start to dance. It's not a reason. It's dance keep you young, keep you beautiful, and keep great like Mr. B. Nice. Awesome. He's a talent. <laughs> He's just one and only. Well, the uh, payoff for both Betty and me has been a series of memories which are awfully nice to carry along as you age along. And adventures, friendships. But finally, that it has kept me able to be so independent. And uh, it's nice to be able to entertain people. And uh, they remember that. If you, if you can do a job, in some cases, just a matter of giving them a laugh. You've left them with something that uh, made them happier. That's a winner. So what, are, what is this here? This was uh, a couple of years after Betty passed. And I did When I Fall in Love. And the pictures in the background are my wife. And everybody in the audience knew that and recognized her. What a wonderful way to create a memory. <laughs> so that's dedicated to my bride. Is that one of your favorite dances? Yes. Uh, I got all tingly when I was doing that, yeah. Well, let's see, here's Nastya. I'm going to... the sticks? Yes, let's do that. It's fun. You one. make me feel so young. I know, we have special number. <laughs> let's see it. Okay. Okay, Mr. Be ready? And a one, two, three, four. Walk. Ballroom Walk. dancing, keeping your mind very sharp. Amazing for the, not just for the body, but for brain as well. Because once we're dancing, it's multiple stuff is going on in our head because you need to control not just your own body, you need to control your dance partner. It's very surprising. People don't think there's much athleticism, but even when you're dancing slowly, you're using muscle against muscle in that slow motion to control it. And this gives you more exercise than you might think. I guess there some people could very easily just um, fall into inactivity. I think that can lead to depression in older people. And if you have something to look forward to and something to try and achieve, you avoid that. She's watching in her own way. <laughs> to see more of our short stories, check us out on Facebook and Instagram or milwaukeepbs.org. A glider works just like a power plant, only it trades altitude for energy. And so the gravity provides your energy to give the 
lift in the wings to support the aircraft in the air. And a short count for that radio check. Thank you. All right, so our guys are spotting for other traffic in the area. The tow plane is going forward and taking the slack out. Clear. Go. Glider ready. So we're at 6,000 feet, 5,000 feet above ground. I'm going to check, make sure there's no traffic around you, and pull on that yellow knob, and we'll turn right to tow plane to go left. Oh, straight out. Yep. All right, here we go. All right. Good tow. Thanks, Ed. It's absolutely the most relaxing, wonderful thing in the world. I love the connection with weather. Meteorology, you know, weather controls our, our world. And the idea of, of, of being able to go up here and literally use the energy from the sun to see aloft and not use any gasoline or electric power or, I mean, once we use our toll, this is free. It's like, it's like sailboat. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking us over to the city. The city uh, usually gives off more heat. The sun, the black top parking lots, there's many of these factories, and that warms up the air and uh, creates a lift. So if you have warm air at the bottom and cold air, it's gonna rise. Uh, just like, you know, uh, warm water goes to the top, warm air goes to the top. See how noise starts going up? So now we turn into it. Now, if you look at that instrument on your right, that variometer, it's going down right now. It's below zero. Yeah. So when we come back around into the lift, hopefully it will start gaining altitude. Then we fly to the next thermal. And you can do this for hours and hours. So you run out, we just gained 200 feet. Looking for the traffic coming at us, which I see none. And then we go out off to the side so we don't block the room. This is year 16 of the Milwaukee River Lake Sturgeon Rehabilitation Program. Here we go, Mr. Sturgeon. And the whole objective is to restore a population of lake sturgeon to their native waters in the Milwaukee River. Just as you have a child grow up and, and uh, leave home, this is uh, what these fish are meant to do. It's uh, very rewarding to, to know that they've They've managed to make it through this growing up period and that uh, they have a good chance of making it out there in the lake. The eggs are actually harvested from the Wolf River and then we bring them here to our rearing facility where they imprint on Milwaukee River water. So the water coming into this trailer is actually uh, from our Milwaukee River and the idea is they imprint on that water so that when they're released into Lake Michigan, they will eventually come back to the Milwaukee River. So we usually start out with close to 2,000 fish. The DNR comes in, they do pit takes. They're just like the little rice pieces that cats and dogs are gonna get. And then when they come through the fish passageways, there's a scanner in there and it'll automatically pick up their number, scan it, and then we know what year that fish was put into the river, where it came from. 
lake sturgeon ha were extirpated from the Milwaukee River back around 1890, and that happened to all the sturgeon in most of the rivers that lead into the Great Lakes, and not just the Great Lakes, but worldwide there was this idea that there were no end of sturgeon and that you could just keep harvesting and they would always be there. Well, eventually they hit the elastic limit of sturgeon and um, basically wiped the population out of the Milwaukee River. So here in Wisconsin, we're lucky in that we're one of the 20 states that sturgeon, lake sturgeon are found in, and Wisconsin is the only state where they're not on the endangered or threatened species list. They are on the watch list. It's so important because the lake sturgeon are an absolutely magnificent creature. They are the largest fish in the Great Lakes. Uh, they are evolutionarily an ancient creature. They can grow up to six feet long and live over a hundred years. Into the water so it can begin its journey. And may you watch that journey over the years. Uh, unfortunately, with their population being decimated for a long, long time, seeing a sturgeon in the Milwaukee River became an impossibility. We're hoping to reverse that, um, erase that, and get it back to the way that it should be. I want to name him Bob. Actually, this is the 16th year of the project. It's a 25-year project because we won't know if the females will start coming back until they're 25 years old. The big hope is that, in fact, we have you know, a viable population of lake sturgeon you know, by the time we're done so that we um, increase the population of lake sturgeon uh, in the Great Lakes. Well, the purpose of smoking is for them to kind of go into more of a defensive action and protect the hive and get back in there. They aren't going to get out as much to uh, attack. They're more about protecting what's in there at that point. So think of it in the wild. If there's a forest fire, they're going to go and try to protect where they're at and not explore. This is kind of mimicking that in a controlled setting. For the top bar, we lay these bars across the top. They're very loose. What happens is then the honeybees uh, create what's called propolis. You can see a little bit of it here. All of the cracks in here and create a solid structure underneath. When we're coming into the hive, we're looking at this to hop that propolis off so we can actually expose the, the honeycomb and honey that uh, the bees have created. So this is what they're building their wax off of on the top. You can see how it was dipped in wax and then from that they start to build their honeycomb down. So you can see the honey coming off of there. The bees actually have two stomachs. They have their own digestive stomach but they also have a stomach where they take the nectar back and then they process it with inside their, their body and they put it in the wax and then it's a fair amount of water in it and eventually they have to take the water, they evaporate the water out. When they get it to the consistency of honey, then they cap it and that's for preservation and it keeps them over the winter time. So this is all, all of it's in the wax and then this up here is capped this is uncapped so they'll cap the honey when it's the moisture is completely gone from it so these down here there's still a moisture content on it a little bit these are that would be your solid honey that you would really try to process typically we would do it once a year we want to make sure that they have enough to to get themselves going we also don't want to take honey from the population that it's using to survive throughout the course of the the spring summer time. We'll make sure we leave plenty of honey in here to not set off in a, an alarm within the hive that they need to collect more. And that's about uh, three pounds or so. When you uh, uncap it, it allows you to save the the wax and and uh, you use a centrifuge 
and then you don't destroy the wax as much and the bees can fill it up the next time. This would be the very first thing to do before we put it in the centrifuge. And this centrifuge will spin around and there'll be four frames in there. The centrifugal force will spin the honey out. We're going to do half of one side. Then we're going to flip them around and do the whole other side and then do the remainder. As a family physician, I used to recommend honey a lot to people, except for the first year of life. Bacteria cannot grow in honey, so that's why it's, it's kind of sterile. Honey is actually used for uh, medicinal purposes. They can use it for salves. You could have two hives, and one hive could go two miles one direction, the other hive decides to go a mile the other direction to get honey. And with their communication skills, those hives will continue to go exactly to those same places. So you could have one type of honey from one hive, right next to it, the other, the other hive has something totally different. Thanks for watching another episode of My Wisconsin Backyard. To see more of our short stories, check us out on Facebook and Instagram or milwaukeepbs.org.